Welcome to GRE. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. The immigrant crisis worsens. Where are we going to house all these people? A simple explainer on what title insurance is. Then where do you find the best real estate deals in this market? Today on Get Rich Education. If you like the Get Rich Education podcast, you're going to love our Don't Quit Your Daydream newsletter, no AI here. I write every word of the letter myself. It wires your mind for wealth. It helps you make money in your sleep and updates you on vital real estate investing trends. It's free. Sign up at getrichseducation.com slash letter. It's real content that makes a real difference in your life, spiced with a dash of humor. Rather than living below your means, learn how to grow your means Right now, you can also easily get the letter by texting GRE to 66866. Text GRE to 66866. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE, heard in 188 world nations from Lima, Ohio to Lima, Peru. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, Get Rich Education founder, Forbes Real Estate Council member, and longtime real estate investor. Our mission here, let's provide people with good housing, help abolish the term slumlord, and get paid five ways at the same time. Immigrants keep pouring into our southern border. In fact, federal agents encountered roughly two and a half million migrants there just last year alone. Now, though not all will become permanent residents, understand two and a half million? That's the population of the city proper of Chicago or Houston all in just one year. How are we going to house all these migrants? This crisis has only worsened. And that two and a half million migrants in a year figure is according to U.S. Customs and Border Protection data. Now understand first that America has about 140 million existing housing units. That's what we're dealing with today. By every estimate out there, we already have a housing shortage. The layperson on the street knows that. And estimates about its magnitude, I mean, they're all over the map. Some as high as America is already 7 million housing units undersupplied in order to house our current population. And you have other estimates as low as that we're only 1.5 million housing units undersupplied. So let's interpolate and kind of be conservative or just use a figure closer to a common consensus and say that we are... 4 million housing units undersupplied. All right, but if that's our given, here's what that means. 4 million housing units undersupplied. To merely reach a balanced housing supply, we'd need to build enough homes to meet population growth plus 400,000 on top of that. And we'd have to do that every single year for an entire decade. Just astounding. And to be clear, that's not to be oversupplied with housing. That's just to reach an equilibrium between supply and demand. Now, the supply of available housing, and this is basically what I'm going to talk about next, is the number of homes for sale at any given time, right? That began gradually descending in 2016. And back then, it was one and a half to two million available units. And in the spring of 2020, like I've talked about before, the housing supply just crashed to well below one million and it still hasn't gotten up from its mighty fall. In fact, it's only about 700,000 units available today. All right, that is the FRED active listing count and FRED sources their statistics from realtor.com. All right, so that's what we're dealing with. That's a dire situation. All right, well, How do housing starts look? Are we building up out of the ground enough to maybe start getting a handle on this sometime in the next decade? I mean, is there anything that could be more encouraging than more housing starts? Well, really, there's nothing encouraging there at all. In fact, new housing construction starts have hit a 10-month low. My gosh, so that's the supply side. All right, what about the housing demand side? 
Well, America's population grew by 1.6 to 1.8 million people between 2022 and 2023, and that number is forecast to climb during the next few years, worsening the housing shortage crisis. And with U.S. births falling and deaths rising, it's immigration. Immigration is what is going to fuel the majority of population growth for the next decade. Immigrant related growth. That is going to impact local housing markets across the country, and it's expected to hit especially hard in the Northeast, Florida, California, Nevada, and Texas. And what's happening is outraging some people. Some cities are housing migrants in public places, even arenas, including ones that Texas's governor, Greg Abbott, has bussed to the Northeast. And of course, New York City Mayor Eric Adams has been outspoken about how to handle the migrant crisis. Understand that there are homeless veterans out there in America, yet the state of Maine is giving migrants up to two years of free rent for new apartments. And that right there has made a lot of people furious. And there are a lot of other cases out there like that of migrants getting free housing. Now, just consider this. John Burns Research and Consulting, they provide a lot of good information to the real estate market, and they have for a long time. Credit to them. And by the way, if you'd like us to invite John Burns onto the show here, or if you have any other comments or questions or concerns, feel free to write into us through getricheducation.com slash contact. That's where you can send either an email or leave a voice message. Well, according to their industry-respected data, some of which is compiled through the U.S. Census Bureau, back in 2021, that's when we reached an inflection point where the U.S. population grew more through immigration than it did through natural increase. And natural change, that is simply the births minus deaths. And that has continued each year since. There is more U.S. population growth through immigration than there is through natural increase. In fact, bring it up to last year, our population grew by 1.1 million through immigration and just 500,000 through natural increase. More than double, more than double the increase through immigration as natural change. And John Burns makes the forecast through the year 2033, so the next nine years, the growth through immigration will outstrip that some more and become double to triple that of natural growth. Overall, every single year through 2033, we'll add 1.7 to 2 million Americans, and they all need to be housed somewhere. So the bottom line here is that immigration-fueled growth already outstrips natural growth, and that should continue and only be weighted more heavily toward immigrants every single year for the next decade, probably beyond the next decade. We just don't have projections that far yet. Well, how are you going to house all these people when we're already badly undersupplied? And understand, I'm not making any judgments on saying who or who should not be able to enter our nation. That is for someone else to decide. In fact, I'm the descendant of immigrants. They are my ancestors. And you may very well be too. And over the long term, immigrants can be an asset. I am simply here asking where and how are we going to house them for the next decade and what that means to you. Tiny homes, 3D printed homes, shipping container homes, none of them seem to be the answer. And of course, population forecasts, when you look out in the future like that, they're going to vary based on the percentage of successful asylum seekers and the 2024 presidential election winner and more. So the figures that I shared with you, they're only the average case. In any case, the crisis is poised to worsen because now you've seen that there is a terrible mismatch between population growth and housing starts. How are you going to solve this? The government needs to ease construction restrictions and promote the building of entry-level housing. More up zoning should be allowed. Do you know what up zoning is? It means just what it sounds like, increasing the housing density, often by building taller buildings. So up zoning is taller building heights. 
All right, well, let's look at really four big impacts that this immigration wave is having on America's already scarce supply of housing. New immigrants typically rent property. They don't buy property. So that's higher rental housing demand. Secondly, expect more multi-generational and family-oriented dwellings. That's what's needed with additional bedrooms and affordable price points like entry-level single-family rentals. If you want to own rental property, that right there is the spot for durable demand. And thirdly, I'm sorry, another impact is expect to see more homeless people in your community, like I've touched on before. In fact, homelessness is already up 12% year over year. That's partly due to inflation. And that is already the biggest jump since these point-in-time surveys have been used. The biggest ever jump in homelessness already. Those stats only go back to 2007. That's when they began measuring it. And that's according to HUD and federal officials. And then the fourth and final impact of all this immigration is that builders and manufacturers will probably see a small uptick in labor availability these next few years. Okay, that part could help. America could help with this labor shortage crunch. But all the other major impacts put more demand and strain on what's already a paucity of American housing supply. And the bottom line is that there are too many people competing for too little housing, driving up prices and driving up rents this decade. Well, I've been talking about lots of people moving north across borders. Me, I've recently moved south across borders, though for only a few weeks here. I'm joining you from here in Medellin, Colombia today, where in between doing my real estate research here, I'll be trekking in the Colombian Andes this week and the Ecuadorian Andes next week, when I'll be based in Ecuador's national capital of Quito. And you know, there's a real estate lesson in this itself, really. Okay, me traveling to Colombia and Ecuador, people often label and mischaracterize areas that they haven't been to or say they hear of the drug trade in Colombia or of some of the more recent, I guess, civil unrest in Ecuador, where I'll be next week, and they think, sheesh, isn't it dangerous in those places? Oh, come on. I mean, sheesh. Colombia is a nation of 52 million people, and it's almost twice the size of Texas. The question is, where? Where in Colombia do you think is dangerous? Don't you expect there would be great variability there? Now, you, the GRE listener, you're smarter than the average American, so I think that you get it. With last month's continued civil uprising in Ecuador, seeing that story in the news, that actually reminded me to book a trip there. <laughs> the opposite of staying away. When they held up all the people at that TV station, that was way out in Guayaquil, Ecuador. To tie in the real estate lesson here, back to your home nation, if you do live in the U.S. or wherever you live, like I do, see, our investment coach, Andrea, she moved from Georgia to the Detroit metro a couple years ago. I don't think you'd want to invest in real estate in Andrea's neighborhood where she lives in Detroit because it's too nice. The property prices are high and the numbers wouldn't work for you in an upper-end neighborhood of Metro Detroit, but people that haven't been to Detroit don't think about areas being too ritzy for investment. Well, of course, some of the areas are. So my point is, stereotypes are hard to shake. I encourage you to get out and see the world. Now, I've got an interesting and really an unlikely update on my property manager that had the tenant rent payment stolen from his Dropbox, meaning I didn't get paid the rent. The property manager, he didn't make good on that and pay me the rent. He wanted me to take the loss from the rent payment that he failed to secure from the paper money order stolen from his overnight drop box. So the manager doesn't want to take the loss. I don't want to take the loss. Well, and I can hardly believe this, but apparently the tenant has agreed to make the property manager whole. The tenant would effectively pay rent twice for that month, and then the property manager will apparently finally pay me the missing rent after it flows through him, the manager. I don't know if the property manager had to convince the tenant that it's the tenant's responsibility to put the payment right into the manager's hand or what. So the tenant 
what they're going to do is pay an extra $200 a month until the $1,550 stolen rent is compensated. I guess what? Eight months of stepped up rent then. So I was just really surprised that the tenant would agree to do that. And, you know, in this saga that I've been describing to you for, I guess, the third week in a row now, you know, one GRE listener, they asked me something like, doesn't your property manager know that you're rather influential in the real estate world? Like thinking maybe I'd get preferential treatment. Oh, to that I say, no, I don't want preferential treatment. I mean, few things are more annoying in society than people that position themselves like that. But I will tell you that I actually did meet this property manager in person before he started managing my properties. And he did wear a suit and tie in the conference room for meeting me, which I thought was interesting. Later today on the show, we've got a guest that's familiar to you. He was somewhat bearish on real estate when he was here with us back in November. That's when he talked about how activity was slow. And you might even want to sit on the sidelines of adding more property to your portfolio. We'll see if that's changed today. Now, over on YouTube, you might very much like watching me in our explained video series. Because in a video format, I can show you where the numbers come from. I very simply break down an investing term like net worth for one video or cash flow or your return on amortization in another one. There's also a new video in our Explain series about title insurance, and this is what you'll hear over there. The title to a house is the document that proves that the owner owns it. Without that proof, the house can't be bought or sold, and title insurance is written by title insurance companies. What a title insurance company does is research the history of the house, to see if there are any complications, also known as clouds, in its ownership. Issues that cloud the title could be like an outstanding old mortgage that the prospective seller has on the property, a previous deed that wasn't signed or wasn't written correctly, an unresolved legal debt, or a levy by a creditor, like an old lien placed by a contractor who once did some work on the windows and was never paid for it. They're all examples of clouds on a title and make transferring the property ownership difficult or impossible. But if the title appears to be clean, no clouds, then the title insurer writes a policy promising to cover the expenses of correcting any title problems if they would happen to get discovered after the sale. Title companies may refuse to ensure a clouded title to be transferred, so it's important to know about any potential issues as soon as possible. Now, there are two types of title insurance. There is lender's title insurance and owner's title insurance. First, lender's title insurance. In most areas of the country, the mortgage lender requires that the property buyer purchase a lender's title insurance policy to protect the lender's security interest in the real estate. Lender's title insurance is issued in the amount of the mortgage loan, and the amount of coverage decreases and finally disappears as the mortgage loan is paid off. And then secondly, owner's title insurance. It protects the home buyer's interest and is normally issued in the amount of the purchase price of the property. Coverage means that the insurer will pay all valid claims on the title as insured. And in most real estate transactions, separate title policies are purchased for the lender and the buyer. And although it can vary by location, the buyer typically purchases the policy for the lender, whereas the seller often pays for the policy for the buyer. And that's title insurance. If you like simple, to the point, education by video like that, and you'd want to get a really good look at me for some inexplicable reason, <laughs> for more, check out the new Explained series. It is now on our Get Rich Education YouTube channel. More next. I'm Keith Weinhold. You're listening to Get Rich Education. For a lender that's a specific expert with income property, you need Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. 
In GRE history, from beginners to veterans, they provided our listeners with more mortgages than anyone. It's where I get my own loans for single-family rentals up to fourplexes. Start your pre-qualification and chat with President Chaley Ridge personally. They'll even customize a plan tailored to you for growing your portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com, RidgeLendingGroup.com. You know, I'll just tell you, for the most passive part of my real estate investing, personally, I put my own dollars with Freedom Family Investments because their funds pay me a stream of regular cash flow and returns are better than a bank savings account, up to 12%. Their minimums are as low as 25K. You don't even need to be accredited for some of them. It's all backed by real estate, and I kind of love how the tax benefit of doing this can offset capital gains and your W-2 jobs income, and they've always given me exactly their stated return paid on time, so it's steady income, no surprises, while I'm sleeping or just doing the things I love. For a little insider tip, I've invested in their power fund. To get going on that, text FAMILY to 66866. Oh, and this isn't a solicitation. If you want to invest where I do, just go ahead and text FAMILY to 66866. Hey everybody, it's Robert Helms of the Real Estate Guys radio program. So glad you found Keith Weinhold and Get Rich Education. Don't quit your daydream. Hey, well, I'd like to welcome in someone that you might have met by now. That is one of our terrific investment coaches, Naresh. Naresh, hey, welcome back out of the show. Keith, it's a pleasure to be back on. Naresh, I know you've got mortgage rates on your mind. It's been such an interesting topic lately since they peaked at about 8% back in October of 2023. And almost everyone this year anticipates that now that embedded inflation is lower, that rates of all types are going to fall. Rates and inflation are typically correlated. And why don't you talk to us with your thoughts about where mortgage rates are currently and where they go from here? Like you said, mortgage rates peaked around October. The Fed did their last rate hike in July 2023. So that's why the lagging effect caused rates to rise a little. And then they've been slowly creeping down since October. And what does that mean? Or where do we go from here in this new year 2024? I've been pretty spot on with what the Fed's going to do. I think they made some mistakes. I think they should have done two or three more 25 basis point hikes in 2023 because we're seeing inflation creep back up. And that's a huge problem for the Fed because their target is 2%. But that's a completely different topic. We can Monday morning quarterback the Fed all we want. The Fed has essentially come out and said that their rate hiking campaign is over. They've hiked enough And it's a take it or leave it. They're just going to hold and hold and hold until inflation reaches that 2% target. So what does that mean for mortgage rates? If we know that the Fed isn't going to raise rates anymore, that means we've already seen it. Mortgage rates have slowly creeped down. And there is a legitimate chance that the inflation rate, that the CPI hits 2% by this summer. There is a chance of that. Right now, we're at 3.3 or 3.4%, but there is a good chance that by the end of this summer, let's say August, we hit that 2% target, which means the Fed will immediately start cutting rates after that. Whenever the next meeting is, I think September 2024, they'll start cutting rates, which means that's going to have an effect on mortgage rates. We can see mortgage rates plummet even more later this year going into 2025. Now, this is just a prediction. There's a chance that inflation could go up if there is a Middle East crisis or World War III or whatever you want to call it. There's a chance that inflation spikes back up and the Fed just, they could hold rates where they are for two years. I don't have a crystal ball in front of me. There was a Black Swan event that happened in 2020. Obviously, there could be a Black Swan event that happens in 2024. We won't know. But what we do know is the Fed is done hiking rates, and they're going to hold as long as possible until we get to that 2% inflation target. What does that mean for real estate? If mortgage rates are going back down, you're getting a better deal today than you were in October 
2023 or November 2023. So it's almost 100 basis points lower from the peak that we saw in October. So interest rates have gone down. They've somewhat normalized to a level that's digestible for investors, still not quite digestible for the average homeowner. And the best part about this, Keith, is that the providers who we work with are still offering amazing incentives, the same amazing incentives, if not better, with the lower interest rates. So previously, we brought up a 5.75% interest rate incentive program, one year free property management, another program that was 224, two years of free property management, 2% closing cost credit, $4,000 property management credit, all sorts of incentives. And those incentives are still in play while interest rates have gone down. So instead of 5.75% incentive that these providers are offering, they're now offering 4.5% interest rate. So that's why I think if there were no incentives, hey, you know what, we should probably wait until the Fed starts cutting again. But with these incentives, this is incredible because they're going to be gone again. The moment the Fed starts cutting aggressively, these incentives are all gone. So you may as well get in now when home values have somewhat corrected and some markets are seeing precipitous declines, home value declines, real estate declines. So Right now is still an excellent time to invest given this economic landscape. GRE listeners are pretty savvy, and you, the listener, you realize that changes in the Fed funds rate don't have a direct change, and they don't move in lockstep with the 30-year fixed rate mortgages. The Fed has really loaded up with the Fed funds rate near 5% now. They basically have a whole lot of ammo in the cartridge where they can go ahead and lower rates if the economy begins to get into trouble. One reason mortgage rates are higher than other long-term rates is that U.S. mortgages can be prepaid without any penalty. The anomaly and what's been different and what's been happening here is that typically there's a spread of about one and three quarters of a percent between the 10-year T-note, which has been 4% or so recently, and the 30-year mortgage rate is about one and three quarter percent higher, which would put it at 5.75. But instead, mortgage rates have been almost 7%, so a greater than usual historic spread between the 10-year T-note, which is more what mortgage rates are based off of, and what that rate actually is. And the reason that that spread has been so high is this perceived greater credit risk or anticipated economic changes like this recession that is always just perpetually around the corner. So we don't really know where mortgage rates are going to go. We know that they're not high. They're actually below their long-term average, but of course they just feel high because the only thing that was unusual is the rate at which they've increased. With that in mind, here as we talk about mortgage rates, Naresh, why don't you tell us more about the incentives that are being offered right now? The incentives are still being offered. The question is, Keith, I want to share two different strategies or two different markets. It's kind of a mix of a strategy and market. The two most popular markets we are seeing right now are in Memphis, Tennessee, and in Florida. Still, Florida continues to be hot. Why is that? Why these two markets? Well, number one, Memphis still has a lot of rehab properties that you can purchase in the $100,000 to $150,000 range. Before the pandemic, it was common to see properties selling for sixty dollars to $80,000, those properties are a dime a dozen now because of what we've already talked about, the inflation, the home values rising, real estate going up. Memphis still offers those options. Now, we work with a provider in Memphis who specializes in the BRRR method, the B-R-R-R-R. So it's four R's. The BRRR, that's not the February temperatures, BRRR, yes. Yeah, it's not the February temperatures. It stands for you buy rehab, rent, then you refinance, and then you repeat it with the next property. So buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. So this is a little different from your traditional real estate investing where you're just buying, it's already rehabbed. So you're buying, renting it out, and then end of story. Here, it's a strategy that is meant to build equity almost immediately. You rehab it. And look, we're not going to get into the details of this right now. I highly recommend that folks, they can go to 
the GRE marketplace and set up a meeting with me if they want to talk some more about Burr or if they're experienced and they know about Burr, they may not know that we offer Burr properties, but our investors have loved Memphis Burr. They have loved it. They have bought more and more. It's one of our hottest asset classes or strategies right now, Memphis Burr. So highly recommend it. What are the incentives? There are actually no incentives that our Memphis Burr provider is offering because the incentive of the Burr strategy is enough to get people to keep buying. They keep getting inventory. They don't run out. They find ways to make it work. Now in Florida, we work with a provider who we've featured on this show a couple of times before, and they're owned by the largest Japanese real estate developer called Sumitomo Forest Street. They're one of the largest Japanese companies in the world. Warren Buffett owns a huge stake, Berkshire Hathaway, in Sumitomo. So I highly recommend this Florida provider because they're able to offer properties at values that other providers can't compete with, at prices that other providers can't compete with. They're offering the incentives that I told you, the 4.5% program. In some cases, you can buy down the rate all the way down to 4.25% if you want. They have two years free property management or one year free property. It just depends on the package that you choose. They're offering closing cost credits. You can negotiate the list price. These are the two most popular partners we are currently working with. And I highly recommend if you are liking this real estate market, you're seeing lower interest rates, you're seeing that there's been a correction in home values and you want to get in right now, contact your investment coach. If you don't have an investment coach, go to the GRE marketplace. You can select me if you want, or you can select the other investment coach, Andrea, it's up to you. And we can share more information. So you're talking about two different strategies here, the Memphis Burr and the Florida New Build. And I think of the Memphis Burr, it's something that's lower cost. It's for an investor with a more aggressive disposition where it will take some of your involvement, even though it's still only going to be remote involvement. And then on the flip side with the Florida new build, you're going to benefit from those low bought down rates that the builder will buy down for you. The longer you plan to hold the property, the more the rate buy down is going to benefit you. And then I also think of the Florida new build as kind of being a low noise investment. You're absolutely correct, Keith. So I highly recommend those who are sitting on the fence I've come on this podcast before and told, said, hey, Keith, you know, right now, I'm not really sure where things are going. Like, it's a little dead. Maybe investors should hold off. Yeah, back in November, that was your guidance. Yep, that was. And now, I think because we've seen the lower interest rates, you can just get in at a much better deal. Everyone can be happy. I think our investors would be happy. And it's a great time to start investing in real estate again. Don't put it off. I remember when I first got into real estate, I was putting it off, putting it off. And I look back and I say, man, I should have gotten in four years earlier, or five years earlier. How many properties do you think it took for you to buy until it changed your life? For me, it was probably when I bought my second fourplex and I had eight units. But I think if you're buying single family homes, it takes probably fewer units than that to really start changing your life. Yeah, one unit's not going to change your life. Two units aren't going to change your life. In my case, it's just a personal story. I bought one the first year, another one the second year, and then my third year, I scaled from two to seven. That was the life-changing experience right there. And the last two properties I bought were new constructions. So number seven and number eight were new constructions. And that also changed my strategy too, because I said, hey, new construction is just so much better than these older rehab properties, just less headache. We've talked about this before on previous episodes. And so moving forward, I'm actually saving up right now to buy my next new construction property. New construction, me personally, I think that's a way to go. There's no doubt about it. And because I went from two to seven, that was the game changer for me, at least on the taxes, on the passive cash flow. And look, I'm relatively young. I'm in my mid thirties. But when I think about retirement, which I don't think about much, but sometimes I do. And when I do think about it, I'm like, these eight properties, if I hold on to them, that's a nice retirement that I have in retirement. That's a great passive cash flow. By then, the mortgages will be paid off, although we believe in refi 
till you die just to get a little more specific about some of these incentives i'm looking at the florida ones right in front of me option one for example is a 4.25 percent interest rate that's with a buy down a 2.75 percent buyer pay point buy down but it comes with two years of free property management i think the best deal if you want zero buy down it's two years of free property management seller paid closing costs of 1.5 percent so that's a 1.5 percent closing cost credit and a 5.75 percent interest rate that you'll be locked into i think that's a pretty darn good deal there are some attractive options there. Yeah, it's interesting, Race. When you talk about how many properties does it take to change one's life? Yeah, you're right. When you buy your first property, your second property, it isn't life-changing. You probably haven't owned property long enough yet to benefit from leverage and, and surely not cash flow just off one or two properties. But what happens is you accumulate more is sometimes you don't have to use and save up your own money to buy a new property. You might want to do that, but at the same time, the properties that you bought a few years ago have built up enough equity. So now that rather than your money buying new properties, it's like your properties buy your new properties for you as you do these cash out refinances. And that's where you really get things rolling. So it can take a few properties and a few years. But Naresh, you're so right about the opportunity really being with new build today. I'm a guest on other shows and a lot of people are just an economics host. They think about real estate investing. They think about higher mortgage rates. They're like, you know, where's the opportunity for an investor today? And that's usually what I tell them. It's with these builder rate buy downs on new build properties. Take advantage of that this year. Absolutely. So like I said, GRE Marketplace, you can get more information, set up meetings with Andrea or me, whoever your assigned investment coach is. If you don't have an assigned investment coach, take your pick and let's get your real estate investment journey either started or on cruise control. Rich, do you have any last thoughts, whether that's this year's direction of prices or rents or the economy as it relates to real estate or anything else at all? Well, Keith, I think we're about to see, and we don't get political on here, but for whatever reason, we tend to see crazy financial markets during election years, whether it's presidential elections or midterm elections. We saw the stock market drop wildly in 2022 during the midterm election year. Of course, 2020, we'll never forget the craziness of lockdowns and masking and social distancing and what the financial markets did. I mean, all the, at least the stock market, President Trump lost all the gains that he had in the stock market as president were lost in over a two month period in February and March 2020 because of pandemic. And then they came surging back. So the point that I'm making here is economically, I shared my vision of just systematically, I think inflation is going to hit the 2% by the end of the summer. The experts initially thought it would hit the 2% by March and the latest CPI reading showed that inflation actually went up. I think we're going to see some type of, I don't want to call it a black swan, but this year is not going to go according to plan. Maybe the inflation plummets because something deflationary happens, or maybe the inflation rises again because something inflationary happens that's just not on our radar. So how does that affect real estate? Well, that doesn't change what we said five minutes ago, which is right now, today, given all this uncertainty, today is still a great time to jump in because if there is a deflationary event, you can always refinance your rate in a year or two when rates are much lower. And remember, mortgage rates are tax deductible. A presidential election year brings more uncertainty than usual. You can buffer yourself from that volatility with real estate and investment that's more stable than most anything else out there. I encourage you, the listener, to check out Nuresh and the other coach, Andrea, at GRE Marketplace, and they can really help you out and help you put a plan together. Hey, it's been great having your thoughts. I think the listeners are going to find this helpful. Thanks for sharing your expertise. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, there's some valuable guidance from Naresh on where the real deals are in this market today. Memphis Burrs and Florida New Builds are really just two of the dozens of options from GRE's nationwide provider network. Learn more, see all the markets, or connect with a coach 
all at GREMarketplace.com. Enjoy the Super Bowl. I'm Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.